it is good to be here. And I, my prayer is that um, when we depart, we all can say the same, that it was good for us to be here on today. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor David, for having us. After I got finished with the notes that I wanted to share, I went and I treated myself yesterday afternoon to some YouTube videos on the prophets. So I was blessed, and I pray that each of you had been blessed because it is a blessing to have a good shepherd inside the building. Uh, so we're going to dive right in. I'm going to practice with uh, the clicker once we kind of get this uh, going. Look at that. So uh, I want to talk with you a little bit on today about uh, righteousness and justice. And then I'm going to kind of wrap with uh, what it is that we're doing within the district as it relates to kingdom justice and mercy. So let's go. On the past several weeks, you've heard from Pastor David about the message of the prophets, and you've probably noticed that there's a common thread in the messages that they send with us. You would have heard that Isaiah quite literally spoon-fed Israel the meaning of covenant. You heard that Amos brought the heat to Israel's injustice and brought that to light. You might have read in your own time about Obadiah and that he forbids blind inaction in the face of oppression. If you've ever read Jonah, you know that he's learned some hard lessons so that we don't have to. And Hosea prompts us to be honorable to all of creation. You know that Micah reminds us of our most noble charge to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Jeremiah, he held on to the promise of God when it became unpopular. Ezekiel, he persisted even in enemy territory. And if we were to even look backwards a bit, we would have learned that the prophet Elijah, that he was able to risk it all. Each of them, though, they teach us this principal truth of God that speaks to us from Proverbs 21 and 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifices. Now, without making this a lecture, we ought to understand first what righteousness is, that righteousness and justice are presented quite differently in our current uh, context than they were in ancient Israel. For many of us today, if you were raised like I was raised, righteousness makes us think about that pattern of behaviors that make us good Christians. Righteousness is about acting right. Yeah, that resonates with some. As if, you know, to please the people is to please God. When we hear justice these days, we tend to think about the forensic character of our civil laws. And time and time again over the centuries, we've might have made the mistake of equating our civility to God's justice. But it would benefit us to know what righteousness truly is. In the context of ancient Israel, righteousness and justice are frequently paired together. You would search and you would find righteousness and justice together, cognates of sorts. They emphasize not only doing right, but being right. In doing right, you see the call in the prophets of truth-telling. You see performing justice. But in being right, we see righteousness refer to one's posture before God, one's faith standing with him. In either context, the word in Proverbs is fitting. Righteousness and justice, they're more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifices. As we fast forward through scripture to the cross, where we celebrate and celebrate it last week, we learn in the New Testament that righteousness becomes us by none other than the virtue of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. We know that there's none worthy, none righteous outside of the covering of his shed blood. And according to Ephesians 1, through his righteousness, we have the forgiveness of sins. 
We have the ability to call ourselves the adopted sons and daughters of God. We have an inheritance awaiting us. And through Christ's righteousness, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. This spirit of promise guarantees our inheritance to the end. Why? All for God's good pleasure. That's why. Righteousness becomes us because of who God is to the praise of his glorious grace. Amen. So I submit to you today that righteousness is not a series of activities that we do to earn our way to the kingdom. Righteousness is about our right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Justice is Jesus. And all that he represents to be righteous is to be made right with God through Christ Jesus. To do justice then is to do what Christ has commanded us to do. First John four and twenty one. And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. This reminds us of Jesus' words in the gospel. You know them. Love thy neighbor. Yeah. But who is our neighbor? If you read together with me, Luke 10, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He was speaking to Jesus. Jesus said to him, Well, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so the lawyer answered, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus says back to him, you've answered rightly. Do this and you'll live. This lawyer or scribe is another term we find in our Bibles. How many of us become lawyers when we get into the word of God, right? We sit at the foot of Christ and we stand up and start asking questions when things get uncomfortable. We aim to dissect the word so that it fits our mold. This student stood up to ask the master teacher a loaded question to see if this self-proclaimed servant of God was a good Jew. The way that we sometimes compare looking for the good Christians. Jesus, in his way, he answers the question with a question. The scribe, an expert in the law, see, he already knew the answer. He quoted back to Jesus from the Old Testament, looking for a wrinkle in Jesus's understanding of it. To see if he would align with him in this thing. The scribe quoted from Deuteronomy uh, 6 and 5. We refer to that as the Shema. It was the center of the core of a person's relationship to love God with your whole being. And then in Leviticus 19 and 18 is the first time that we see this commandment so plainly, love your neighbor as yourself. Love, see, would have compelled ancient Israel to be faithful and obedient to God. Love God. And so the faithful then would also love their neighbors no less than they loved themselves. Now, the question that the man asked, though, was, how do I inherit eternal life? The Old Testament covenant would have suggested, you know, do this and you will be blessed. Do this and God will reward you. Do this and God will provide for you. But this question and answer ups the ante. What do I do to get this eternal life that you teach of, Master? Jesus makes it plain. You do this and you will live. Who is my neighbor? But, there's always a but, isn't it? But he... Wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? 
We often seek to justify ourselves, don't we? We portray ourselves as righteous. How easy we seek to be agreeable with the word of God and not obedient to the word of God. We want to seek God's promises without committing to the covenant. We don't want to hold up our end of the bargain. We get selective with our mercy. We get conditional with our love. Not awaken, not, not here. The others. The error is not in seeking the truth from Jesus. The error that was made was seeking the truth in one's self and then trying to get Jesus to agree with you. Such was the case for this lawyer whose question had the ulterior motive to see if Jesus would agree with him, that he was justified in being selective with his justice. His question is also a legal one. The scribes, see, they would have defined the boundaries of relationships between people. They would have been setting orthodoxy. This is how we do what we do. There were, even back then, natives and aliens. And there had to be a defining line between who was who within the kingdom. Surely this Jesus wasn't trying to reset our boundaries, disrupt our order, reset our long-standing tradition. Surely he was not changing the way that we were perceiving God's precepts and changing the way that we would honor God himself. So, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Neighbor is used throughout scripture. Sometimes it's a general term. It refers to those in our proximity. We're neighbors, those of us sitting near each other this morning. We have neighbors in our neighborhoods. Sometimes it refers to a friend or just another, someone similar to me. Sometimes it refers to fellow Christians or folks who we're in covenant with, our neighbors. The, 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 the New Testament carries this tradition, and we find that our neighbors are often our fellow Christians. But Jesus, he stretches the application of the word neighbor from that Old Testament context and he begins to teach that we're supposed to love everybody. Jesus told him to love their enemies. Truth be told, scripture teaches us that our neighbor is not only that person who resides nearest to us or those who we find familiar, but our neighborhood extends beyond the walls of our church. It crosses the borders of our culture Everyone and anyone who we might come in contact with is our neighbor. Jesus answered him now and he said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among the thieves. They stripped him of his clothing, they wounded him, and they left him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, well, he chose to pass by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, he came and looked and he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where the wounded man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. You know this passage as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Yeah? There's a bit of sarcasm in that subtitle, right? As if somehow most Samaritans were not good and this was the exception. This was the good one. The Good Samaritan. We use the phrase a lot. We refer to ourselves and others as the Good Samaritan when we good do, de good, do good deeds, when we give, when we contribute. We've named hospitals and charities the Good Samaritan. But truth be told, if we knew these people's history, we might not be so inclined to align ourselves with the Samaritans. Because see, in our humanness, because I don't know about you, but I'm human, I might blindly look to align myself with the priest. Why not? Do God's work, serve God's people. I intercede for them. I bring the sacrifices to the Lord. 
I live my whole life in his service. Yeah, I don't want to be the priest. Or maybe you'd identify with the Levite. Righteous by birthright, consecrated for the good Lord's use. We'd have good reason to boast. Some of us, though, it's not lost on me, might see this story and would align ourselves with the victim. I've been wounded. I've been bruised. I've been hurt by some hurtful people. Wounded yet innocent. That's me. We would have wanted to have been anybody but the Samaritan. So the Samaritans, see, they'd been long outcast from the neighborhood. Unwelcome in the circle of their Jewish contemporaries, sometimes how we isolate some from our circle of good Christians. Enemies of the state and enemies of God, the Samaritans, that's who they were at this time. See, the Jews at the time of Jesus had adopted the understanding that they were to love their neighbors, but hate their enemies. That's where they were at at the time that this scribe asked Jesus this question. But it was in Matthew 5 and 43 where Jesus corrects their understanding, tells them that you're to love your enemies. You're to bless those who curse you. You're to do good to those who hate you. You are to pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That was different. The priest and the Levite who came across that lone traveler, they might have thought a little bit more about what their interference would have cost them than about what their interference would have done to bless the wounded. If I were a priest and I see someone, something that looks like a corpse coming up, I might have to think twice, you see, because I'm the one who renders the sacrifices. I have to keep my hands clean. I have to stay pure. It's outside of protocol for me to do this. So I pass on the other side. If I'm the Levite, I might be on a mission of sorts. I'm preoccupied with what it is next that I have to do, and I'd rather not be distracted by this inconvenience. After all, somebody's probably going to come along after I pass. And so I'll just walk around the other side. There are others who probably would have passed the man just content with, well, you know, this isn't really happening in my neck of the woods, so I'll leave it to them to sort out their troubles. But Awaken, you and I, we know better. We know that when we love others and love them well, we find ourselves compelled by compassion. Compassion is love in action. We find ourselves persuaded that the inconvenience is worth it, that the consequences are worth it. We count the cost and we have decided to love because he first loved us. We have endeavored to worship God in spirit and in truth, and we find ourselves aligned with the heart of God for all of his created people. Compassion would make us to love them and love them real good. The final character in Jesus' story is not a Pharisee, is not a kingly leader, not even a wealthy layperson, an unlikely hero. A Samaritan, a long-standing enemy of God's people, becomes the hero, and it shocks Jesus' audience. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, the Samaritan. He poured oil on the wounded man and wine to purify his wound. And he set him on his own animal and he brought him down to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, will you? And whatever you spend when I come again, I'll repay you. This Samaritan isn't said to have been a person of means. We probably should assume otherwise that this was a person of meager means. He probably gave what limited resources he had in his own satchel to tend to this wounded person's needs. Then he gave up his own seat 
and took the journey on foot, making himself probably doubly susceptible to the same thieves that injured the man in the first place. Having given virtually everything he had, he went to the nearest shelter, and it was not a Hyatt or a Holiday Inn. He stayed. The next day, those two denarii would have taken care of their stay and then some. He asked the innkeeper, you take this and you look after him, promising to repay him. When I read this story of the Good Samaritan, I see what loving well really means. Loving well means that compassion moves us, not our own motivations. Loving well means that the amount of our giving, no matter how great or how small, is enlarged when it is God who is leading us to love. That our past or our present identity, it does not disqualify us from loving others. And likewise, their past or their present identity doesn't disqualify them from receiving our love. We'll worry less about our reputation and we'll worry more about love's impact when we love well. We can trust that our needs will be met even if we give our last. When we love well, when we give up our seat, when we give up our comfort and security, when we give up our agenda and our timetable, scripture promises us God will provide. We'll receive the award reward in this life and in the next when we love well. Obedience is indeed better than sacrifice. And so we ask God today to help us to know how to love them well. Love and loving well is a journey, not a destination. If you're the priest and, you know, you just can't relate Love them. If you're the Levite, and you're busy and you'd just rather not be late. <laughs> Love them. But they stole from me, Jasmine. They wounded me. You got to love them. They set themselves up to be my sworn enemy, Sister Lynn. I still have to love them. Love them from the posture of the Samaritan. Love them, awaken, like you've got nothing left to lose. Love them like you've got a whole eternity to gain. So I ask you then what Jesus asked this lawyer. He said, so which of these three folks do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves. I thought that question was interesting and I'd never seen it before that Jesus actually corrects our perspective with this question. You see, the lawyer asked Jesus, who is neighbor to him? But this question, you see, God calls us to go and be the neighbors to them. While I was reading this passage seeking to understand who my neighbor was, God challenged me and asked me, whose neighbor are you? If you want to do justice, and if you want to love mercy, and if you are interested in this inheritance of eternal life, this parable tells us to go and do likewise. In the district, we have five focus areas, at least at this part of our journey, that we're encouraging ourselves and one another to get involved in for benefit of our communities, for benefit of those who are not like us. Racial unity, immigrant and refugee support, the advancement of women, human trafficking, and prison reform. What we've been doing is speaking with district churches, 130 some odd churches, one-on-one -on -one conversations, just like I had with Pastor David, 
and we've been talking about what's going on in your community. Are there things that you've done that perhaps others could learn from? Are there resources that you need that perhaps the district can help to, to provide so that we grow together in this journey of love that we're on? At the top right, our near-term goals are to complete out outreach to each of our district leaders and churches before our next district conference in October. And we are going to continue a series of small group sessions that pastoral leaders will come to to learn more about ideas like loving well, to learn more about the ideas in our five focus areas. We also are planning some one-on-one -on -one engagement activities where, just like today, we come, we sit, we fellowship, and we discuss what justice looks like in Jesus. And we want to empower, we want to educate, and we want to connect. We have learned a couple of fundamental things in our outreach with pastoral leaders over the past uh, several months, that we have two types of churches, if I look at it at a macro level. We've got churches who are well-resourced but can't find the opportunity, and then we have churches who are flush with opportunity, but they need the resources. And so we want to learn and think creatively about what that starts to look like when we come together as a district on kingdom justice and mercy. The big box in the middle offers the website for justice engagement where you'll find more information and then all the who's who at the bottom of who we are under the leadership of Reverend Walker. So you're aware, up next on the small groups for pastoral leaders, this spring, next month, we're going to have a series on listening well. By the fall, we are going to start with our first focus area on racial unity. And then we're going to continue in the winter on immigrant and refugee support. The small group sessions are just a couple hours for pastoral leaders during the weekdays where we sit and we look to scripture and we look to leaders in these spaces within the church on these topics. Finally, I want to share with you that we're really excited to be piloting an engagement, happens to be with Stonecrest Church, around biblical justice. And I'm personally really excited about that. Justice these days is a very crowded conversation. And so what does it look like for the church to assert itself and talk about what God says justice is. So we'll frame biblical just justice, we'll come to terms on kingdom terminology, things that we all can see and relate to in scripture. We'll compare biblical justice and then the justice that we see at play in the world. And we'll commit to our own rediscipleship. By the time we get to that point, it's my prayer that we'll all realize we need a little bit of rediscipleship in that area of biblical justice. And then we'll think about what it takes to create culture and apply this within our respective churches. And so with that presentation and that summation of what we're doing in the district, it's my hope that Awaken continues and persists on your own journey of justice, providing them Jesus and loving them well. And if we really do believe that our Christ is who he says he is, then we ought to believe that he can do what he said he was going to do. Amen? Amen. God bless you.